All are welcome to this service of worship in Glenrothes, St. Margaret's Church of Scotland. Whether you're here in the church or taking part via the live stream right now or catching up later. And you are welcome whether you share the Christian faith of this church or do not. Let me wish you a very Merry Christmas. Thank you. Uh, this is the second slightly strange Christmas during the pandemic, a time of fewer services. We didn't have a service here yesterday for Christmas Day, nor on Christmas Eve. And many people's plans have been changed. But it's wonderful that we can be here. My name is Donald McEwen. I'm the interim moderator in this church. And I'm so pleased to be here with you on this Boxing Day, which is also known as St. Stephen's Day. I lived in Ireland for four years, and I'm joined today by my Irish wife. I mean, I've only got one wife. <laughs> it's not my Irish wife as opposed to my Scottish wife elsewhere, but my Irish wife, Maya Sheridan, whom I met in Dublin. And in Ireland, this is known as St. Stephen's Day, and indeed one of the central squares is called St. Stephen's Green in Dublin. And so today, it's a St. Stephen's Day service. I'm hearing an echo, Ian. Uh, I, I just wonder if there's an issue there. I'm hearing myself half a second later. Okay, that's maybe, a, it's still there, but it's not so bad. I just wonder if there's anything, any kind of issue today on the sound. Okay. Now, the carols that we're going to sing today, uh, that's, that's better, that's better, thank you. The carols we're going to sing today were mainly chosen by the elders of the church at the last Kirk Session meeting of 2021. And these are the favorites of the elders of this church. Could I also say that the service next Sunday, the 2nd of January, is at St. Ninian's Church, and it's at half past 10, 10.30, and it's happening in person, unless laws change between now and then, and but will also be on Zoom, and those Zoom details will be on Facebook and the church website if you cannot attend in person. Well now, yesterday was Christmas Day, and so we'll light the final candle in our Advent wreath, the white candle in the middle that is lit as a sign that Jesus Christ is born. The light of God has come into the world and we celebrate Christmas today. This is the first Sunday after Christmas. And as you can see, we are joined by a manger and a child in the crib. The Apostle Paul wrote, when the appointed time came, God sent his son, born of a woman. Well, it's raining pretty heavily and it's quite chilly this morning. So what an appropriate carol to begin our service with. Hymn 305, 305, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. 1, 2, and 5 of hymn 305 on the screen as well, In the Bleak Midwinter.
Let us pray. Loving God, we gather today so glad that we can be together in worship, in person or on, and online, coming through a cold and wet morning, and yet into this place of warmth, the lights lit on the tree, the candles lit at the end of Advent and in the time of Christmas, a crib before us, reminding us of the gift of your child to the world. And we come before you in thanksgiving for the year that's passed, another strange year of coronavirus and so many other things. But we give you thanks for your presence with us through this year, for our family, whether sharing our household or popping in to see us or sending videos, FaceTiming from across the world. We thank you for friendship, those who brought us to church today, those who might pop in later, those who have, by a friendly word, a phone call, an email, shared joy with us. And we give you thanks for all those people, all those frontline workers who have worked so hard for us this year, for our safety and our health, those who gave us our booster jags, those who have kept our roads clear, the emergency services who attend in all weathers and thousands of other people. We give you thanks for them. We thank you for nature, for the green spaces of Glenrothes and for the rivers, the snow on the top of the Lomans, all that is beautiful and reminds us of your loving purpose in our world. We give thanks for this church, for all that has happened over the past year, for Eileen's ministry in the first half until she moved on, and for all who have cared for the people of this church and of this parish, those who have shared their faith with young people, those who have managed and led this community in difficult times, all our visiting ministers and preachers, all involved in our covenanted partnership. And more than anything, loving God, we thank you for being in our world, sharing all of our experience. Merciful God, we also pray to say sorry today for things we've got wrong. Times have been impatient and our priorities have been mistaken. We're sorry. Please forgive us, we pray. And help us sense what really matters for our world and in our lives in the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, tell me, was uh, Santa good to you yesterday? Had you been nice? Did you put a stocking out on the mantelpiece and some carrots for the reindeer? It's always important to have a, a large enough stocking, I always say, at Christmas time, because sometimes Santa has quite a, a lot that he wants to give us. So do you want to see what I got for Christmas? All right, okay, let's see. Let's see. Um, here we are. I think they've maybe fallen out a little bit. Here we are. Yes, I got a lovely gold wrapping package with a collection of second-hand golf balls. <laughs> Wasn't Santa good to me this year? White ones and yellow ones, very handy for a day like today when visibility is about 300 yards or so. And I'm just so glad that Santa has got the message that we need to reduce, reuse, and recycle. And that's true. COP26 happened this year. I went one day to march on a wet day like this in a, a march for climate justice. It's one of the most amazing memories of the year and I've just about dried out. Uh, and so this present, of course, it's a wonderful present 
to help me play golf and not worry if I lose my ball because I've got lots more. And golf has been a lifesaver when indoor activities have been cancelled. But it also, these secondhand balls in a small way, small way, remind us that this is God's planet and that resources are precious and that we should reuse whenever we can. So thank you, Santa, and to someone sitting quite close to me who might have helped him know what I needed this year. Did anyone else get a great present? Who else can tell us what lovely presents they got? Just shout out. Slippers. Well, that's handy in a cold climate. Baffies for Christmas. Are they called Baffies in Glenrothes? They are in the East Nuke. Very good, very good. Are they furry, your new Baffies? No. Very good, okay. Who else get anything nice for Christmas? Handbag. Handbag. Very handy, that's right, for putting things in. Excellent new handbag. Anything else? A wheelbarrow. A wheelbarrow. <laughs> Does Santa think that your garden needs a little bit of attention? Yes, we'd asked for, ask for a wheelbarrow, and all the way from the North Pole came a wheelbarrow. Excellent, lovely. A nice plastic one, or made of uh, galvanized steel? Galvanized. galvanized wheelbarrow, that'll last forever. Excellent, okay. Anything else? That will have to do. What a practical Christmas we got in St. Margaret's. Very good, okay. So I'll put these away safely. There we are. I've never played any courses in Glenrothes. Maybe this year I'll come down and play a nice Glenrothes course. I'd love to play Balburnie actually, now that I think about it. That'd be nice. Any members at Balburnie here? Anytime, sir. We'll sort it out. We'll, what a lovely, there we are. Christmas has come again. Very good. So there we are. Let's sing now about that manger that is uh, in front of us in the church here. 312, 312, away in a manger.
We have two readings today in our service, and they tell the story of Stephen from the book of Acts. And our reader is my wife, Maya Sheridan. The first reading is taken from Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse 8. Stephen, a man richly blessed by God and full of power, performed great miracles and wonders among the people. But he was opposed by some men who were members of the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called, which included Jews from Cyrene and Alexandria. They and other Jews from the provinces of Cilicia and Asia started arguing with Stephen. But the Spirit gave Stephen such wisdom that when he spoke, they could not refute him. So they bribed some men to say, we heard him speaking against Moses and against God. In this way, they stirred up the people, the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and took him before the council. Then they brought in some men to tell lies about him. This man, they said, is always talking against our sacred temple and the law of Moses. We heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will tear down the temple and change all the customs which have come down to us from Moses. All those sitting in the council fixed their eyes on Stephen and saw that his face looked like the face of an angel. We sing uh, that lovely carol now, 309, 309, still the night, holy the night.
We'll hear a second reading from Maya, and then there'll be a second bit of talk uh, after that. But let me take the story up to where we've got. At first sight, it seems so strange that St. Stephen's Day is today, just the day after Christmas. What has the story of Stephen's life got to do with Christmas? Well, Stephen's story may not have much to do with the account of Jesus' birth, but it has everything to do with Jesus' life and death and resurrection, as we'll see. Stephen was a Jewish man who lived in Jerusalem. And in the early weeks and months following the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, that's when the earliest church began. And Stephen joined this fellowship. And he quickly got a role in Jerusalem with Jesus' own disciples there. As the church grew, they realized they needed people to look after the practical issues, money. Joe, it's always the same, isn't it? And so they elected people to look after the practical issues, money, and to support the vulnerable in their community. And so seven deacons were appointed, and Stephen was one of them. But he was more than someone who could just add up a column of figures. It seems that he could do amazing things and could clearly speak with power and coherence. The book of Acts is sure that Stephen could do this because God's Spirit gave him wisdom. It was this courage to speak and to act for his newfound faith in Jesus that got Stephen into trouble. Almost all the first followers of Jesus were Jewish. And Jesus was Jewish, as is clear from the Bible. Jesus was circumcised when he was eight days old and taken to the temple when he was 40 days old by Mary and Joseph. And Stephen, too, was Jewish. These earliest followers were convinced that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, the appointed one sent by God to reign. They didn't think they were leaving their religion behind. Rather, they thought this is what their religion showed them, that Jesus was God's presence in the world. But not all the Jews agreed. Some thought that Stephen and others were turning away from the true faith. You could call Stephen a progressive, and some of the other Jews perhaps traditionalists. Maybe they knew that Stephen was sincere. In their heart of hearts, they knew that he was expressing his deepest convictions, but they wanted him stopped and his message blotted out. So they made it seem that, G, that Stephen was against their God, the God of the Hebrews, against temple worship, against Moses. And to do this, they told half-truths and complete lies. Already we can see something intriguing in this story. Stephen was a follower of Jesus. But that doesn't just mean that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah. It means that his life started to mirror the life of Jesus. He walked the same paths that Jesus walked. The same things that happened to Jesus now happened to Stephen. Jesus performed great miracles and wonders. So did Stephen. Jesus spoke with wisdom from God's Spirit. So did Stephen. Jesus' integrity brought forth opposition from fearful men. So did Stephen's. And Jesus' accusers bore false witness against him that he would tear down the temple. So did Stephen's. Can we begin to see how Stephen's story follows Christmas? 
Mary and the shepherds and the Magi believed in Jesus and followed him. But what does it mean to follow Jesus in a world of sin, of selfishness, and of fear? We're only given 24 hours to find out. Let's go back then, that day before, to the first Christmas day. And we sing now that beautiful carol that begins so many carol services at 315, 315, once in Royal David City. We now uh, go to the next part of our story about Stephen, and Maya will read for us again. The second reading is taken from Acts chapter 7, beginning at verse 54. As the members of the council listened to Stephen, they became furious and ground their teeth at him in anger. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw God's glory 
and Jesus standing at the right-hand side of God. Look, he said, I see heaven opened and the Son of Man standing at the right-hand side of God. With a loud cry, the members of council covered their ears with their hands. Then they all rushed at him at once, threw him out of the city and stoned him. The witnesses left their cloaks in the care of a young man named Saul. They kept on stoning Stephen as he called out to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not remember this sin against them. He said this and died. Thanks be to God for these readings from his holy word. He said this and died, and he died for his faith. And we sing now of the faith that Stephen died for. In a Scottish carol, we'll sing it in English, not Gaelic. You might be pleased to hear. And it's in the book at 314, 314, Child in the Manger. In between the first and the second reading that Maya read for us, Stephen made a long speech to the high priest and others in the council. In this speech, he gives a brilliant summary of the Old Testament, which was the only Bible he knew, his Bible. But as his sermon continues, he becomes less and less diplomatic. Or you could say, that he lets his radical faith show. He talks of how the ancient children of Israel rejected Moses and began to worship the golden calf and then worship the stars in the sky. He says to the very people whose job it was to look after temple worship that God doesn't live in houses made by human hands. Then he really lets rip 
How stubborn you are, how heathen your hearts, how deaf you are to God's message. You are just like your ancestors. You too have always resisted the Holy Spirit. He then tells them that they have betrayed and murdered God's righteous servant, meaning Jesus. Tactful, he was not. It seems that for Stephen to follow Jesus, he felt compelled not only to share what he believed, but to publicly name, blame, and shame some of those who had not followed Jesus and who were complicit, at least, in his death. And that led, inevitably it seems, to a further echo of Jesus' life in Stephen's. He wasn't crucified. That was the Roman method of execution. He was stoned to death. But even in this appalling death, there is one final echo of Jesus' life and death. Stephen's final words were these, a prayer, Lord, do not remember this against them. And we remember that Jesus had said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. Stephen, like Jesus, had compassion on his killers and prayed for their forgiveness and acceptance by his loving Father. Now, on this St. Stephen's Day in 2021, we live in different times, for which we are thankful. We can share our faith without fear of persecution in Scotland. But there are parts of the world where that is not the case, notably parts of Pakistan, Egypt, and elsewhere. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, wrote this about Christians who were martyred in Egypt just a few years ago. The Christians were given the opportunity to convert and chose not to, believing, sorry, knowing the consequences. And then they were killed most terribly. And the one who got away tells that each of them as they were killed, were calling out, Jesus is Lord. What immense courage people in our day and time have shown for their Christian faith. We might grumble a bit at government restrictions on worship, but we can surely see that that is not anti-Christian or anti-religious, but pro public health. So we are not, I hope, invited to be martyred like Stephen, but we are called to be Christian in every aspect of our lives, loving those who are difficult to love, caring for God's world in a time of climate change, giving what we can for the most vulnerable, living lives of integrity, even when our culture becomes casual about honesty and goodness. Stephen followed Jesus. One of those Christmas banners says, following, he followed Jesus. And that meant that his life mirrored his Savior and echoed Jesus' love and compassion and integrity. And on this day, Following Christmas Day, we sing carols of joy that give thanks for Jesus' birth, but we also have sung carols that have committed ourselves to following that child as a man who lived and taught and loved with courage and was put to death for who he was. St. Stephen's Day follows Christmas as Stephen followed Christ. Let us also follow Christ in our own place and time. Let us care 
for the vulnerable. Let us love with integrity. Let us speak of the truth we hold. Let us believe in forgiveness for all. And it's that care for the vulnerable and compassion for all, which is behind a legend of good King Wenceslas on the Feast of Stephen, St. Stephen's Day. And so we're now going to sing that carol, Good King Wenceslas Looked Out. But before we stand, let me tell you how we're going to sing it. Because this carol, it's not in the hymn book, it's only on the screen. This carol is in three parts. There's a narrator, and the narrator's words are printed in black, and we'll all sing those. And then, King Wenceslas, he has words, and they are printed in red. And so only half the, the church are going to sing the king. And I think my wife should be singing the king. So we'll have the side of the church nearest me and the lectern will sing the king's words in red. And then the page, when's this last his page? He has words to sing and they're only printed in blue. And that will be the side nearest the Christmas tree will sing the page. All right. Red for the lectern side, blue for the Christmas tree side, black. We sing all these words together. So we stand to sing, Good King Wenceslas looked out on the Feast of Stephen. <laughs>
Well done. <laughs> that was terrific. Thank you. We come before God now in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray for this Christmas season and for all the lives that we will lead during it. And we think especially for anybody who is vulnerable, who may not be out in the snow, uh, but who nevertheless needs our compassion and our care. We think of those who are in hospital at this time, uh, or others who are unwell or for whom we're concerned. We remember those who are lonely, who are spending Christmas on their own unexpectedly, or those who've been unable to travel. We remember anyone struggling with anxiety or with sadness. We think of people we'd love to be with at this time, here in St. Margaret's Church, or sharing meals together, or opening gifts with over the season, but we cannot be with them in person. Bless them, be near to them by your presence, we pray. And in a quiet moment, we bring them before you in our hearts. God of love, we pray for your whole world and places where it is cold and also hot, places where floods are worse than ever, where extreme weather affects our planet. Be with those who are most affected by that, by poor air quality, by uh, having few vaccines or little access to them for coronavirus and other illnesses. Help us to share freely across the world with, um, with what we have, with our wealth and rank possessing. And merciful God, we pray for your church. And we thank you especially for all with responsibility for this church in St. Margaret's, for the elders and others responsible here, for the covenanted partnership across Glenrothes, for the Presbytery of Fife, and the Church of Scotland nationally, and for your church across the world, that your light would shine in us, giving us kindness and perseverance as we walk in the steps of our Master, continuing to offer help to those in need. Eternal God, we remember also those whom we have loved, who have been part of our lives, with whom we've shared Christmases and new years past, and whom we now no longer see, who, whom we trust have been found in that place of perfect light and love in heaven. May we, in our time, be found among your beloved, forgiven people, uh, reunited with those whom we have loved in perfect light and peace. And hear us now as we join together in the prayer your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our final carol was not chosen by the Kirk Session, but I wanted to finish our Christmas service with it. 301, 301, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
I wish you a very happy Christmas and a wonderful new year when it comes. And now go in the light of God and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this Christmas, this St. Stephen's Day, and forevermore. Amen.